The end of the summer, 1415, Henry V, King of England, invades Normandy in France. His aim to reclaim the throne of France, which was rightly his. He lays siege to the town of Harfleur, which takes weeks to subdue. A third of his army dies from dysentery. A third of his army so sick from dysentery, they must return to England. Dysentery, it's like diarrhea, but it's thicker and quicker and you can't stop it. Henry V, our king, is now in trouble because he has naught to show for his loans that he's obtained in London and the pawning of crown jewels for this great expedition into France. But he's not finished. He will march north. He will bluff and show these French that he is master here. But he has barely 5,000 bowmen, long bowmen like myself, barely 2,000 knights and men at arms. But they will march to Calais. The biggest barrier will be the River Somme. So off we march. Many of the bowmen are mounted on horseback, but many are not, and their shoes will wear out before they reach ever Calais. But a French army now shadows us, and there are sorties, various attacks, and the king is lucky enough to have two prisoners, Frenchmen, men at arms, and they are persuaded to tell us of the French plan. Their plan was simple. They would have their 7,000 bowmen rain down hell upon us. Then, their cavalry will charge. Over 2,000 knights, heavily armoured with their lances, will ride down the bowmen. Then two, maybe even three divisions of French foot soldiers will calmly march down the battlefield to finish us off. But our king had a plan of his own. Each bowman was ordered to cut down a wooden stake his own height, sharpen it at both ends. This we will hammer down in front of us and angle it at the chest height of a horse and sharpen it. A chef de frise, a hedge of spikes it will be. So on we march, but crossing the river Somme, it was difficult because the French army blocked our path time and time again. But this king of ours, Henry, God bless him, marches us south. We cut across, the French must follow the Somme around. We find a ford and our army is across and we outpace the French. But a sad thing, we cross their path. And by the trail of footprints and mud that we see, we know we have a mighty host ahead of us. And indeed, October the 24th, 1415, the French army blocks our path. Near Tramacourt, Massanel and Agincourt, there they wait. But it is late in the day. The French set up camp. We have no food. We are beginning to starve and dysentery is taking its toll. As nightfall comes, the king orders us quite simply, sit down. Keep quiet. Any man who makes a row will have his right ear cut from his head. Any noble sire who makes a row will have his spurs struck off and he will be sent back to England. So in silence, the English and the Welsh do sit in this muddy battlefield to be. And then it rains. The next morning, we can see the French fresh, strong after their night of drinking and feasting and boasting. We could hear them. And now they form their ranks. Upon the hill we gaze at them. So numerous, so many, that their banners, they have to remove some from what I hear. But now we form our ranks. The king's plan. It is simple. I will draw it in this earth for you. We're at the bottom of the hill. We have the woods further up on either side narrowing down slightly towards us. The king arrayed his bowmen in each corner of the battlefield, 2,500 bowmen in each. They hammer in their wooden stakes, angled at the chest height of a horse and sharpen them. Our men at arms in the center, a very narrow, narrow center indeed. The French at the top of the hill, their bowmen should have been arrayed in each corner. Crossbowmen, bowmen and their horses in the center, but no. Their bowmen could not be seen. In fact, all you could see was a mighty host. Not that many horses, because what had happened was quite incredible. Instead of there being 2,000, 3,000 horses ready to charge, there was barely 300 on one flank, one side, barely 600 on the other. Many of the horses were being exercised, walked up and down and warmed behind the army. But this army of the French now, this mighty host, was so dense with numbers, they couldn't get through. 
So our king now seizes the advantage. He orders every bowman to lift up his stake. And then with a mighty roar, our army marches up towards the French. St. George! With every step they call out, St. George, St. George. The men are marshaled, keep in your files, keep your formation. The French could have attacked. All they had to do was charge down the battlefield, but no, for they lacked command. We had our king, he was in charge. The French had many and many of their commanders hated each other. Within bowshot, we stop. We hammer in the wooden stakes, sharpen them, angle them at the chest height of a horse. Now we are ready. And then a single English knight, Sir Thomas Erpingham, commander of the bowmen. We know this old man. And he raises his marshal's baton. And then he shouts as he races past us. Now strike 5,000 bowmen of England and Wales. Now draw their mighty bows and shoot. French chroniclers wrote down what happened. The sky simply turned black as wave after wave of arrows poured down into our men. Now the French cavalry charge, but they can't charge. The ground is too wet, too sodden with mud. They walk their horses forward, but it's barely 600, barely 700 horses. And on they come, walking with their lances up, trying to build up space, pace. But what they don't realize is this. There are bowmen in the woods now. We have moved so close. And as they finally pick up some speed, the bowmen in the woods level their bows and shoot into the flanks of the horses. This drives the cavalry towards our center. And on they come through this terrible arrow, arrow storm. Men tumble from the saddles. Horses go wild, charging over the battlefield. And then finally, when they plow into the wooden stakes, knights are thrown clear of their saddles to be butchered amongst the men, simply dispatched with a knife straight through their visor. Now, panicked, terrified, horses gallop back up the battlefield. But coming the other way is the French army. Wave after wave, two massive divisions, at least 7,000 men in each division of heavily armoured knights. Step after step they come, exhausted because of the mud now ploughed up by the horses, when all of a sudden their own cavalry plough straight through them. And the French divisions halted. They had to stop to fill in the gaps left by those horses riding through their men. So brave these French, for they came on step after step in the deep mud, exhausted in their armor, the bowmen pouring the arrows in, when finally they engage. The legend has it that the English men-at-arms took a step back and this wrong-footed the French. Now the weight of numbers pressing behind the French push men over, the bowmen still pouring arrows in until all the arrows are spent. So the bowmen throw down their bows, draw swords, hammers, axes, anything they have, and they join in now the murder, for they surround the French army, and for two hours they will batter it to death. They will climb upon the mounds of death, hacking men to death who could not defend themselves, for they were pressed in so tight. Barely numbers at the front could fight. The rest we simply butchered. The battle, you know, barely lasted two hours. It is said we lost between two, maybe 500 men. They gave up counting the French losses after seven and a half thousand dead. We will never know the truth of their losses. What we do know is this, a few fought many, and with a great leader and stout hearts of English and Welsh, we won the day. I was born in the heart of England in the small town known as Birmingham. Not far from my birthplace is the market town of Stratford-upon-Avon, and its most famous son, of course, was William Shakespeare. He wrote the play, Henry V, immortalizing the story of the Battle of Agincourt, but contained within that play is a speech, part of which I have used often. Let the story the good man teach his son and ne'er shall crisp and crispian go by from this day to the ending of the world that we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he who sheds his blood with me this day shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, for this day shall gentle his condition. And those men now abed in England shall think themselves accursed, and hold their manhoods cheap, whence he speaks, who fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. 
Cry God for Harry England and fair St George.